If you want something to happen enough, then it actually will happen. Okay. In fact, that's why we're stood on the stage today after 15 years. Because we wanted it to happen. You know what I mean? There was a kind of thrill of anticipation, which I hadn't experienced at Glastonbury for quite some time, and you felt somehow, without even speaking to them or meeting them, that the band themselves must have been amazingly nervous about it and realising that it was a, an opportunity not to be missed and an opportunity unlikely to be repeated. She came from me, she had a first for no She stood in sculpture into Martin's cards, that's what I... The audience were very much on their side and wanted them to do well. I took it to a supermarket. I don't know why, but I had to start it somewhere. They did do not just well. So it started there. They did amazingly. I said, pretend you got no money. And she just laughed and said, huh, you're so funny. I said, yeah. Huh. Well, I can't see anyone else smiling in here. Are you sure? You wanna live like common people You wanna see whatever common people see you Wanna sleep with common people You wanna sleep with common people like me But she didn't understand And she just smiled and held my hand Jarvis is a very shrewd commentator on a certain kind of British way of life, English way of life, even. and uh, there's not much of that about, and I miss it. And perhaps if they hadn't done Glastonbury and become as successful as they did, they might still be there. You know. make a list of the ten great gigs of all time and uh, I've been to an awful lot, it would certainly be amongst them. Certainly the best thing I've ever seen at Glastonbury. Well, it's been quite colourful because uh, I've been sitting out in this kind of elite area backstage, uh, uh, sitting at a table there, rather like a two-bit hall, people coming up with kind of radio and TV programmes. So we're ready for you now, John, going out and doing things that I didn't know I was supposed to be doing. But I was involved in the making of a film with the Archers. And it's one of those strange things where you're talking to the characters and you're kind of halfway, but they're, they're the characters, but they're out of character and they're on radio, but it's actually on television. It's very confusing. And I was standing there talking to one of the lads out in the audience and some bloke in the standing watching suddenly 
ran at me and rugby <laughs> tackled me and uh, it was a, it was an uh, yeah and it was it was affect I think it was affectionate you know I don't think it was uh, it was an affectionate He's just rugby completely tackle. Completely overcome with yeah, his adoration but, for you. But, but, well, I wouldn't go so far as that. But it, it did hurt because like, I mean you know I, I'm. You got a, a scar. I was no, that's, not, that's, that's unrelated to. Oh. But it, it's it's I am of an age when obviously if you get knocked to the ground, bits of you fly off. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and people are standing around saying, "Is he still breathing?" It really did hurt. I have to admit. But did he apologise? No, because he you know he's been out of it and he just melted away into the crowd but it's all on film so it'll turn up in something like one of those awful programs no wonderful programs like uh, auntie's christmas bloomers you know, chris tarrant presenting or something uh, like very or possibly, yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah so that was your day so well that so, was a bit so, that, that's been pretty much the focus of my day that, oh, yeah. there's a there's a fantastic wooden scorpion uh for say i mean huge and I, I always... I, well, how I, huge? Well, the size I mean, of this? No, I mean, the size of this room, which obviously the audience can't see, but it is gigantic. <laughs> right. Made by four people. And Small it's, it's, wedding market. And it's... Uh, how much? Uh, well, that's, it's an auction. Oh, I see. And in, in the past, I've, uh, I've bought things here and taken them home and, and placed them somewhere in the house so that my wife would discover them with a thrill of excitement and come down mm. and rain kisses on my eager, upturned face. And the last one I brought home, she, she, she shouted from upstairs, she said, this is a joke, isn't it? <laughs> and so I'd, I'd like to buy this 20-foot-high scorpion yeah. and uh, install it on our lawn while she was asleep <laughs> and uh, laugh that one off, you know. Have you put uh, a bid in then? No, no, I haven't yet. No, I'm thinking, I'm considering my position, really. It all started 30 years ago with a video recorder. Watch a program whenever you want to. What a great piece of kit, we all thought. At first it was so simple. Press record to record and play to play. Then came the remote control, automatic tuning, timers, tracking, seven-day planning, and those eight-digit number codes you had to program in. For our grumpy old men, it was like asking a monkey to paint a Rembrandt, and to add insult to injury, the only people who understand it are the kids. My wife and I really look forward to their coming home so they can do it for us. But then, of course, they know too much, you know what I mean? So they fix it for their own purposes, you know, so you, you go to watch a video and you find that they've sort of reprogrammed it so that it'll bottle black currants or something do you know what i mean it'll do something other than what you expect it to do we've got stacks of videos that we've never seen because we can't make the video player play them and dvds do me a favor <laughs> there is, has been some kind of genetic leap uh, and ch children are born understanding i think it's because they don't have they're not frightened of it you know they'll just i bet this is what you do and then, if it doesn't, oh well, okay, we try, the and they'll try something else. Whereas, you know, I'm very expect, you know, expecting something to go terrifically wrong. I think there's a dangerous number of options in a car. In the car that I've got, there's a kind of stick of controls, and I have no idea what it's for at all. Absolutely no idea. But the car seems to go all right without it, you know, without my knowing what it means. And there's just too much, too many gadgets. Motorways first, traffic sort of stands still on the M25 and... There's something which has been engaged at some stage that interrupts the radio station that you're listening with traffic advice. And I don't know how to switch it off. And so I'm driving along, I've been listening to some record that I really like and singing along with it, possibly if there's nobody else in the car. And suddenly, somebody will come on and tell me what's going on in the M25. Now, I don't, you know, I know a lot of people drive on the M25, but frankly, I don't give a f what's happening on the M25. But I don't want my records to be interrupted by people telling me. Uh, I have a, a, a clause in my contract that says I don't have to take part in anything involving women and cucumbers. I'm joined here now by a legend in Glastonbury, the one and only Mr. John Peel. Hello, John. Hello, Joe. Yes, yeah, very nice to be here. Thanks a lot for coming to talk to us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, yes. Now, you've come to Glastonbury year after year, pretty much since the festival started. Has a lot changed since the early days? I should say so, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, this year, I can't help not seeing that it's, it's quite a middle-class affair, really. I mean, a lot of people turning up in their BMWs and uh, their Fiat Punzos, that kind of thing. Of course, in my day, it was very much a question of hobnobbing with David Bowie and wiping the sweat from his uh, unusual armpits. Well, what's your problem with Fiat Puntos? I have one. 
I don't have a problem with them necessarily, except that they're driven by quite yobby young people who play terrible music on their car stereos at full blast. Like that Human League track. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't you want me, baby? Don't you want me? Whoa, 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 whoa! What kind of bands can we look forward to in the next part of our show, John? Well, Joe, you can look forward to the likes of Faithless, Coldplay, uh, Ozzy Matley, <laughs> and uh, another one. <laughs> You're doing very well, considering uh, you're blind, aren't I'm you, blind, <laughs> yes, yes. But it's a cardboard yes. element. I can't see because there's cardboard in front of my face. There's a, there's a fantastic wooden scorpion. Uh, for say, I mean, huge, and I, I always. I, well, I, how I, huge? Well, the size. I mean, of this? No, I mean, the size of this room, which obviously the audience can't see, but it is gigantic. <laughs> right. Made by four people, and Small it's small wedding market. And it's uh, how much? Uh, well, that's it's an auction. Oh, I see. And in, in the past, I've uh, I've bought things here and taken them home and, and placed them somewhere in the house so that my wife would discover them with a thrill of excitement and come down mm. and rain kisses on my eager upturned face. And the last one I brought home, she 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 shouted from upstairs. She said, "This is a joke, isn't it?" <laughs> and so I'd, I'd like to buy this 20 foot high scorpion yeah. and uh, install it on our lawn while she was asleep <laughs> and uh, laugh that one off. You know. Have you put uh, a bid in then? No, no, I haven't yet. No, I'm thinking. I'm considering my position really. <laughs> well, that will be a technical difficulty. Well, that's what we call a technical problem there, and frankly, we have absolutely no idea what it is we're supposed to do to. Is it? And I could be on stage listening to Coldplay play right now. It, it could be. So, what is this all about? What is this item? Well, I think beards just look kind of scruffy, mm. and uh, yeah, no, not. not uh, <laughs> this is men with beards. Men yeah? with beards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, what is it about men with beards that you don't like? Well, like, you Have you ever thought of growing a beard yourself? <laughs> <laughs> it, it did cross my mind. It's, it's just that you, you, can't, you can't really... You need to be able to see the whole of somebody's face to know, I think, what they're thinking. You, know? mm -hmm. you need to be able to look at the whole face, the movement of the mouth and so forth, to be able to discern... You know, how, There's always how, the fear that somebody's holding something back or hiding there is, something. There is, hiding behind the beard, yes. yes. Famously, you've got a beard. Um, you've yes. always had a beard. Uh, not always. <laughs> That's a well, little unfair. But it's, uh... <laughs> not, when, not when you were five. <laughs> no, no. no. I don't know, I'm feeling Blue Peter, I don't know about you. Yeah, there's there there nothing a children's TV presented. This is a, a model of the site here, and uh, uh, that's it, really. And we've not I, had I a chance to a look at it us, us very soon. I think very, very shortly there will be a purple puppet will appear between us. You've got a good, interesting fact about the drummer <laughs> this way. <laughs> I don't know if, he's, if you want people to know about it. No, it's well, brilliant. You know, now that we've, we've set it up, now yeah, you've got to do it. Yeah. What's he going to do? Come yeah. and whack all well, of us? You never know. You know I'm in the mood after, yeah, after exactly. my earlier experience. That is the most violent story I've yeah. ever heard. Yeah. All of the archers <laughs> at once. <laughs> <laughs> Just well, because you're There's you a staggered. couple of them that wish they hadn't, yeah. let me tell you. Um, no, he, t he takes his dog. Whenever he goes away, he takes his dog to a, an exclusive pet hotel where they all have their own beds and they all, you know, they get gourmet and food and stuff. Takes their dogs Shane there? Ritchie. I'm probably breaking some shocking. And how do you know yeah. this? I, I know that because I went to take my dog there. Oh, and, uh, wow. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's right. And it's not a Ponzi dog. Yeah, and then uh, it's not a Ponzi dog, which is why he never stayed there. Oh, okay. I just went, hang on a second. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got, we've got dogs. Can we talk about dogs? It's, uh, what, sort of, what sort of dog is it? Uh, it's a bearded collie. Oh, my dog? Yeah, his yeah, yours. Dog. I have yours. no idea what his dog is. No, well, what's yours then? This is fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> this, the well, I'm just, not really just want to know. I'm sorry, but I don't really want to know. Confused and slightly chilly yeah. people just yeah. going, what's your dog then? <laughs> um, what's wrong with that? That's, though, that's you what know? we should... You're not this like, is real life. Because yeah. normally we have to sit here and pretend that we're interested in, in, the in bass and players stuff. and things right, like yeah. that. Nobody cares about bass players just except their families. But I should pretend I'm a bass player. No, but... You know, that would, and you can ask that would me be difficult to bounce. You still haven't told me what sort of dog it is. I don't know. It's quite... I think it's quite a... What's he called? I don't know that. I'm not... Stalking hey, your dog. But your dog. Oh, my dog. just know that. Oh. You, you can't <laughs> be that detached. I mean. I'm a very lazy man. I okay. just never bother. Never around giving it Because I thought if I give him a name, I'll only shout it, I'll have to, you know, sh and then he'll only come back and then I'll have to, you know. Just a yes. dog with no name. So, yeah, so I thought it's best don't give him a name and then he'll just run off. Okay. And then, you know, he might come back. I'm not entirely not. convinced that you're telling us the truth. <laughs> I've got, what do I stand to gain from making up a story about the no, drama no, but from I, Sweden? But the, I bet your dog does have a name. Though. It does have a name, okay. yes. Right. He's called Winston. Winston? But okay. the reason he's called Winston isn't, a lot of people think Winston Churchill. Bulldog. Yep. No, no. Uh, he's actually named after Stan Winston, the special effects uh, the guy that builds special effects. 
Have you had enough of this at home yet? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. sure. This is just... <laughs> but no, no, but it's <laughs> interesting because... What's that's, your dog that's, called? That's, well, we've got two. There's one called Bernard right. and one called Nelly. Bernard is a kind of sheep dog. Is uh, it after Manning? No, 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 no. Just because all of our pets have always had kind of just old, solid names, yeah. you know. But of course, Nelly, that's, you know... Nelly. It's getting hot in here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So take off all your fur. Oh, oh. You're going <laughs> you to have to explain it's that. It's getting hard I'm, in here. I'm just a country boy. I don't he's know what you're of, talking about. He's, he's one of the, you know. Do, anyone down. fancy any Damien Rice? A bit of music or something? And oh, you yeah. can, you we'll can carry, carry on, on your doggy about. tails Damien Rice. while we take some music. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a dog. Are you doing a buffet? <laughs> <laughs> Damien Rice, anybody? <laughs> Come as a curry. Uh, anyway, Damien Rice came by um, earlier on this afternoon. He's not until Sunday What's afternoon. What's his dog when called? Does he have a dog? In 1976, I got a job on the night shift at Cadbury's thinking that I was going to become an international socialist revolutionary. And the reality of doing the bar six shift with the ex-convicts soon put me in my place. And I was back in my bedroom listening to John Peel's show. Peel was an all-points bulletin of important football scores for, for Liverpool fans in particular. There were times when even your local radio station wouldn't cover some of Liverpool's forays to places like Trabzonspor in Turkey. And you get this very droll, slightly dry voice, which just seems to say, well, for those of you who are interested, we won 2-1 and apparently played quite well to boot. And you go, fantastic. For which I thank you, John Peel. Peel was somebody who I thought was getting away with it on a massive scale. I thought that if he could, then certainly the likes of me could. And uh, he was good enough to send a couple of postcards assuring me that that was the case. I can remember him sending one which said, Dear Kev, how's it going? This is a serious inquiry, Peel. And you know, things like that, you know, that's, that's a message from God, basically. Those are, those are the things that sustain you through your years of rejection. I bombarded the local radio station with letters saying that I wanted to do my own radio show. And then um, they relented after a while and put me on against the tube on Friday evenings. <laughs> Listeners 37, of whom one was Peter Joseph Hooten of the Farm Pop Group who invited me to be their manager. There was a period when it seemed that the farm were recording Peel sessions almost on, the, on a monthly basis and then um, we became friendly. We had a shared love of football in the form of Liverpool Football Club. Peel's a landmark for a certain stage that all groups aspire to and if he didn't exist you'd have to invent him. In away days, and especially in Powder, which is a story about a, a band who want to make it, to actually make it. One of the big events for them is actually hearing John Peel play their first single for the first time on national radio. To the merry prankster John Peel, the original Scouse Chancer, a happy, happy, happy birthday with lots of love from the Farm and Half Man Half Biscuit Football Club and their manager, Kay Sampson. Good luck. I was um, living at home in Glasgow and absolutely everybody at that time seemed to be in a band. Everybody had that kind of punk ethos of let's just pick up a guitar and go for it. Everybody listened to Peel of course and John was just a total hero really in those days. He seemed to be like the one person that you could have a voice through and I think that Altered Images felt that a real measure of success and achievement would be to do a John Peel session. We played the Leeds Futurama, which was a big, big music festival, and like the Banshees were playing, The Cure, Simple Minds, lots and lots of groups, so we were kind of like at the very bottom of the bill, playing at like 12 o'clock midday. And I think that John Peel just happened to catch us, I don't know why, it was just like our lucky break and he asked us to do a peel session not long after that. I remember I was still at school and I literally jumped into the back of the transit van, um, went down to the studios and made a bail, recorded the session and then straight back up the road to 
to school the next day or whatever. It was all a bit mad. I can remember we were like sitting at home waiting to hear it on the radio and just the complete joy of them being so over enthusiastic about us. And before we knew it, we had our own recording contract and we were asking John Peel to do backing vocals for us on our records and stuff. In many ways, it all came to us quite easily because people responded exactly the way we wanted them to respond. And I don't think we realised it could have been so different. <laughs> I think that John is really instrumental in the early stages of a lot of groups. And then I, I think that he's probably and rightfully moving on to the next bunch of young, you know, scallywags that come along. I don't know why he was so enthusiastic about altered images. I don't know why he was so enthusiastic about me. I'm just awfully glad that he was. And a little bit depressed that I've never actually managed to say one single sensible thing to him throughout the years of bumping into him. Uh, well, my dear, are you in a band? Yes. That's very, very nice indeed. I think he always thinks, she's not very bright, that Claire Grogan, is she? I'd like to um, prove to him one day that I'm slightly smarter than I, than I appear in front of him. I suppose, yes, it must have been 76 I started listening. I remember listening to Ramones quite a lot. And I remember thinking, this is quite exciting. And I thought, I'd, I'll start my own punk band. So I did. When I went to university in 1977 with Paul Whitehead, called the Right Hand Lovers, rather embarrassingly. Feely's always played crap. And I, I can't honestly believe that he's enjoyed a lot of it. He must have hated a lot of it. But it was always entertaining and I remember we played Nevermind the Bollocks in its entirety. Uh, even the band God Save the Queen, which was my favourite song at the time, so uh, I was, um, yeah, that was good, very impressed. I am an anti Once our punk band had collapsed in ruins, I found I'd quite enjoyed being in a band. And so we started another one, which eventually became the Hatred. A strange little forgotten niche. Probably because we were shit. I think the main attraction to the start of the Higsons for John Peel was geographical. Because we were in Norwich, we were relatively close to where John Peel lived, and so he kind of championed us. He picked up on our first single, and then he gave us a session quite soon after that. We thought that was it, we were on the way to the big time. We were going to be huge international stars. But all it led to was a string of other Peel sessions, which was very nice. It used, it used basically, that's what kept us going, was the money we made from, do, from doing Peel sessions. Oh yeah, they paid. And to a young person who could live on chips, it would keep you going for a while. Our first single was one minute fifty. And then, and then we were starting to do sort of three or four minute long, and it was, it was epics. And we did the session we thought was very good. And after one track he said, I don't know, it seems to me like the tracks are getting far too long these days. He, and, he, and he sort of backtracked, said, oh, I'm not trying to have a go at the Higgs, but he was. <laughs> and he was right. I don't think you had to be an avid listener of John Peel to appreciate him. I think he's uh, the genius of him, as far as I was concerned, is that you knew that somewhere, somewhere he was challenging Radio 1's accepted playlist, even though you might not want to hear it, at least there was this presence there having a bash at it. Of course, he had to play a lot of crap to do it, so it was best if you didn't listen to him and just tip your hat off like that. Peely's on, well done Peely, but I'm down the pub. That's well, that's well done, isn't it, Ted? Thank you for all the Well done, and all the help and love and support. Happy birthday, John, and thank you for all the support over the years. There you go. You certainly kept us going in the Higsons, and it was much appreciated, your early support of the Fast Show. Your late support, is, where was it? <laughs> <coughs> The 
we used to have a late night show and we'd suddenly hear one of our records and we'd go, we're on the radio. I don't know why he used to like the faces, but he used to help us, give us a few good mentions, which were very important. A set list in those days to the faces was like something unheard of. It, that we used to sort of do live shows and say like, what are we doing next? And John would always have a little chuckle over that kind of uh, approach. And um, he saw something very ad-lib in there but, and very impromptu. And he, he used to encourage it. He'd invite us time and time again to do his live radio shows. And I thought it was quite an honour to be asked. They were very funny shows. Always ended in collapse and chaos. I remember before the audience came in, because it was all live, we used to gather in the pub and talk about Liverpool, just to keep John happy. The faces used to get so ripped that John Peel almost wouldn't allow us to go on. And sometimes he used to come on in between numbers and say, oh, come on, boys, you, you can't do that, you know, like falling off the stage and stuff. And we used to tease him. We used to sort of uh, play extra loud or something and make the meters sort of read in red. And he used to go, oh, you shouldn't do that. Not many people know that John is a fantastic mandolin player as well. I've never seen John more embarrassed as when he played on that uh, Maggie May. Rod asked all the faces to, to come on. And he's, uh, I remember Rod pulling me aside and saying, here, yeah, let's go Peely on the mandolin. And we're all going, he doesn't play mandolin. And uh, he said, exactly, you know. We sit him up there on a chair and we all point at him. We dragged him on and he was going, I can't go on, no, I can't do this. And we're going, John, you're on now. It's great. I think he broke a few strings, but he also had a little chuckle as well, you know, sort of, oh, dear, I don't know how you got me to do that. He's in our 60. Bloody hell. There was a competition for bands to play uh, here at Glastonbury, and there's a brief film that we've got about it, and I think you'll find it's rather charmingly narrated. One of the excellent things about being a Radio 1 DJ is that I get to choose records that I like and to choose bands that I hear and like and put them on the radio for other people to hear. And here at Glastonbury they've done something similar this year with a, a competition and the overall winners of that competition are going to be here on the second stage shortly and uh, they'll be rubbing shoulders with the like of Franz Ferdinand and Orbital and Badly Drawn Boy. Well, if I was wandering by and I heard the subways playing, I'd certainly stop and listen to them. Will they be back next year topping the bill or will we be trying to remember their names? Time alone will tell. Yeah, they were, they were really good, don't they? Yeah. Thought, yeah. Feller in the Hat was a master of the cliche, I felt, but uh, that was uh, they were the winners, the Subways were the winners of a, a considerable competition, as I understand it, actually thousands of entries, and uh, I know the final 20 have, uh, have got tracks available on an LP, and the Subways came out on top of the end, and were pretty good, I felt. Yeah, I thought they were great.